We now have Dr. Subhimal Ghosh, Professor and Convener, IIT Bombay, who would be talking on improving climate services for agricultural applications and disaster management. Dr. Ghosh is a recipient of various awards and fellowships, such as the Devendra Lal Memorial Award, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, Young Scientist Award 2012, and Young in Investigator Award 2012, among many others. In the past, he had been part of prestigious committees such as Project Monitoring Committee of the Ministry of Earth Sciences, Project Monitoring Committee of the Bhabha Adamak Research Centre, Member of India-UK Water Centre at IIT in Pune, etc. I welcome you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting into this uh, very important uh, workshop. And I'm really honoured and humbled to get the opportunity to uh, present our work in this August gathering. Um, yes, I'll, I'll quickly share my slides. I hope uh, this is visible. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, so you know, to start with, I'd like to mention is that we all are aware about the IPCC Assessment Report 6, which were just out uh, in September and it of course uh, it of course has given a very clear message about the code rate for humanity considering significant increase in uh, climate stresses which are coming in terms of uh, uh, climate extremes in case of droughts in case of floods in case of extreme precipitation in cases of tropical cyclones and so on and so forth and it is very clear now because of climate change uh, the irreversible changes are happening and because of this irreversible change uh, we would be facing significant losses in terms of lives in terms of um, in terms of in terms of economy will will we'll face significant losses and uh, and and this is actually a major challenge and it is also being mentioned very clearly in ipcc assessment report 6 is that even now also if we stop uh, greenhouse gas emission Still, whatever carbon dioxide that is there in the atmosphere, that will significantly increase the global warming level for the next 10 to 20 years. And that will have significant problems in terms of uh, different sectors which are closely associated with climate. For example, we have been seeing that significant increase in the extreme events like, like extreme flood, uh, tropical cyclones, etc. That is actually creating a lot of problems um, to the world as well as in our country. So considering this fact, what is also important for the climate community is that not to just show the, of course, what is scary is scary, the scary picture of the future, but also to come up with certain services and solutions that can help the population, that can help the society to resist some of these climate stresses. And uh, today's my presentation is specifically focusing on this specific aspect. So now let us try to understand what is the current status of climate services. So if you look into it, uh, climate services, I would, I would first say, I would first compliment the Ministry of Earth Sciences and the Indian Meteorological Department. They have made tremendous improvement in weather forecasting and extended range predictions. So when you're talking about weather to medium range forecast, we are talking about three to seven days forecast and extended range means we are going for two to three weeks. And both the scales have made tremendous improvements. There is no doubt. And there are huge number of initiatives which have been taken by Ministry of Arts Sciences and India Meteorological Department to extend this kind of services to stakeholders like uh, agricultural uh, advisory, um, uh, you know, tropical cyclone, you know, cyclone forecasting system. We have seen the success story of cyclone forecasting system. Uh, you know, uh, I have, I have heard that in 1970s, around 1970s, there was a big cyclone that hit the you know West Bengal Orissa region, and because of that, lakhs of people actually died. But if you consider the cyclone, a similar strength cyclone, or maybe with a higher strength, we can see that you know the mortality is almost zero, and we could actually make a very good evacuation planning for the cyclone, which is an exceptional improvement. So we can see that if we improve the climate services, we can actually resist the climate stresses to a greater extent and that's what is needed at this moment at least for 10 to 20 years adaptation becomes very very important thing even making a significant improvement at a few sectors still there is a big gap 
between the if you're considering the operational products which are which are by india meteorological department or which are by ministry of earth sciences and other ministries and applications so this was actually i mean in fact uh, as a researcher i also thought that you know we are actually generating a very good forecast which are very useful and farmers are really very happy but the re reality was something different when i started interacting with the farmers i would get the opportunity to interact some of the farmers who are from Nasik region, you know, Nasik is a vineyard, Nasik is famous for vineyard, and there are a lot of grape farmers. And these grape farmers are actually uh, quite educated grape farmers. When I started interacting with them and I asked them that, uh, do you use the IMD forecast? They are really very useful. They say that they don't use the IMD forecast. They know that it's good, but they don't know how to use it because there is a gap in resolution there are certain other aspects so i mean some of the things and also i have interacted with few other stakeholders and then what we have summarized is that you know the first thing is that the stakeholders need to aware they need to be aware that the forecast cannot be perfect they consider the forecast to be perfect and when it is not happening they do not have they do not believe in the forecast so that's one of the major problem the second problem is that you know any forecast have errors and uncertainties we scientists understand that but the stakeholders may not understand that so we need to address we need when you're giving the forecast we also at the same time provide them some tool that can address the errors and uncertainty the third problem which is a major problem in fact i have been talking i mean i have mentioned this to many of the iid indians or tropical meteorology scientists and imd scientists i've said that you know first we have to make the hindcast available hindcast means uh, if you let's say if you are doing forecasting with a very improved model let's do the same thing for last 15 or last 20 at least for last 30 years and find out how the model would have performed if it were there 30 years back and that information is very useful let's say a, a stakeholders will have confidence on the model when he can understand that how has it performed over the last 30 years and they can understand the grape mirror pattern and accordingly they can develop a mental model and that's very important and that part is essential which is at present not very well available by the imd but i hope it will be available in the near future the fourth one is that you know for extreme events extreme events are very challenging and if there is a forecast for extreme events sometimes there are a lot of false alarms so stakeholders do not believe in forecast because there are a lot of false alarms uh, then gap in resolution as i was saying that IMD gives a forecast that, you know, let's say 12 kilometer or 50 kilometer resolution, but uh, the farmer is interested in his plot and he says that it's a 12 kilometer, it's a long distance, I don't understand how it is useful. And uh, the most important part is that when we, what we try to do is that we develop our own science and technology and we force it on the stakeholders, rather than we do not make them involved in designing the tools that can use this kind of services. So when you are designing a climate service, the stakeholders should be a part of the development team, and then the forecast system would be really useful. So I'm just giving a few examples, which we have been doing over the last few years. So I, I, as I was mentioning that I am I'm just giving a few ex examples. The first one is uh, urban flood forecasting. The second one is a different concept, which is a flood risk forecasting. The third one is flood evacuation, and fourth one is irrigation water management. So, so we'll first start with the urban flood forecasting. Um, so I'll, I'll just give you a brief overview of this, what, how, how did it started? So as you are all aware that in 2015, uh, uh, there was a severe flood in Chennai uh, in the December, in the month of December, and that results, you know, around 500 mortality and huge loss. And uh, immediately after that, um, then the principal scientific advisor visited IIT Bombay and, um, and and we had some meeting and after that uh, he has suggested to develop a team uh, who will be developing india's first real-time urban flood forecasting system which is end-to-end -end. so before 2015 there was no urban real-time urban flood forecasting system which was existing so that was suggested and i was uh, i was fortunate that i was considered to be the lead of the team uh, the team consists of 30 scientists from eight institutes and national labs uh, as for example, the institutions were uh, IIT Bombay, of course, was the lead institute, and then IIT Madras, uh, Anna University, ISC Bangalore, uh, India Meteorological Department, then INCOIS, 
and then uh, NCCR um, and, uh, and yes, so these are uh, an NCM at WF. So there are eight institutes and 30 scientists from eight institutes joined hand together. And one of the, I am really proud of my uh, colleagues who were actually involved in this project. And we could develop this kind of real time flood forecasting system within a record time of one and a half year. Within one and a half year, we could complete everything. So I'll just tell you why it is a very complex and complicated problem. So if you are considering an urban flood forecasting system, let's say this is the urban region, there are multiple issues. The first thing is that if you are considering the urban rainfall, that's a very complicated process because urban rainfall gets intensified because of multiple other reasons. And, and there is a huge spatial variability of urban region. So th let's say this is the urban region. The urban rainfall forecast itself is a problem. Now, there is an upstream watershed. For example, in Chennai, there was a Chennai watershed that let's say if it is receiving a very high rainfall and soil is almost saturated, then entire flow will join the uh, urban region. There is a reservoir and there is always a chance that reservoir will fail because of that you have to release the water. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing is that it's a coastal, Chennai was a coastal city and there's a huge storm surge and tidal things. Tide and storm surge may result into a significant coastal flood. It's not just a urban flood because of urban rainfall. It is urban flood with urban rainfall, plus reservoir release, plus up, upstream watershed, plus storm surge, plus tide. So it makes it a really, really a complicated issue. And within urban regions, you have buildings, road, drainage, you need fine resolution, digital elevation maps. So it was, it was, it was really a challenging task. So if you are considering this, uh, so what we have did, what we did here is that this is the rainfall product. So for rainfall forecasting, what was used is that we have considered National Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. So remember, this forecasting model was for six to 72 hours. Um, and we have done a specific statistical downscaling to get a forecast at a station level. And also, when there was a continuous flood which is going on or continuous rainfall, then we have used data to do casting. That means in the next two, three hours, what is happening now, what's happening? So this kind of uh, now casting was done using a proper data assimilation for the coastal. So this was taken care by NCM at WF and IIT Bombay. The coastal condition, this was done by Inquise and IIT Bombay, where tide, bathymetry, tide and search forecast was done. The hydrologic condition was done, hydrologic prediction was done by uh, IIT Madras, where water levels, reservoir levels, the past conditions we have, we have considered, then we have done a stream hydrologic forecast. And the urban, mod, urban flood modeling was developed by IIT Bombay and National Center for Coastal Research. So where we, and also on Anna University because they provided very important high resolution map. We have done a bit of survey and then we have considered all of them and we developed an expert flood forecasting system with a 3D visualization. So, so first I'll tell you what was available. So let's say if you are going for a forecast, the National Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, which is at NOIDA, which is a Ministry of Arts Science uh, organization. So they provide 44 ensemble forecasts around 3 p.m. every day. So today at 3 p.m., you'll get for next three days, what is the forecast? And there will be 44 ensembles. Now they have reduced it a little bit. And at the same time, every six hours, they generate one single ensemble, which is a deterministic forecast, continuously giving the um, uh, forecast. And there are a lot of challenges with the challenges because of modeling uncertainty. They're under. So I have already mentioned all of them. So what we started doing is that first we have developed a very simple statistical downscaling. So we have the 44 ensemble. So there is a spread which provided by maxima and minima and there is a min. So what we did, we performed a quantile regression. Quantile regression means it is something like this. Uh, given a forecast, what is the extreme rainfall possible? So we are not saying given a forecast, what is the mean rainfall possible? That is a simple regression. When you are going for quantile regression, what we are saying is that given a forecast, what is the extreme rainfall possible? And that's what we have done with the quantile regression. And these are some of the results. You can see that if you are considering 95th and 99th percentile, so you can see 90th quantile rainfall regression. We can see that on 1st December, when the rainfall happened, it shows 250. Of course, actual was 350 it is still less. But it still shows that you know extreme rainfall is happening. The problem was that if you are considering the GFS forecast on that specific day, it didn't really show extreme rainfall is happening over Chennai. But if you perform this kind of quantile regression, it starts showing. So it starts giving you some kind of alert that look something is happening. And uh, there are certain other validations. So we have picked up some other events, and we are finding that model is working well. 
at least for these cases you can see that 99 percentile extreme quantile, quantile extreme rainfall uh, there you know it is higher than the observed so observed are within limits so the model is actually working well which you have checked with multiple other cases and then the second one was flood modeling so one of my colleague professor shubankar karmaka developed this flood model which is using a mic flood and we have considered a very fine resolution you can see uh, you know different shape of the grids were considered considering the building footprints considering the roads and different things we have to consider uh, it was a very complex model which was a three way couple model yes it was a, it was a it was a three way couple model and then uh, you know we 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 developed the flood model and what we have found is that for 80% of the locations so what we did we, we ran it for 2015 flood and this is important because there was no data which was available for 2015 there are a lot of data collection immediately after the flood so we have used that flood, used those data around 5 500 points of data were available and uh, we have found that for 80% of the points the error was within 1 meter See, for the for the disaster mitigation people it doesn't matter if it is if the error is i mean if they, they are more only more interested in if the flood level is two meter one meter three meter something like that for them it doesn't matter if it is 50 centimeter or 55 centimeter or 60 centimeter so five centimeter precision is not really uh really required for the disaster mitigation people so we have understood after interacting with them so they are they are very happy when you have said that you know 80 percent of the points are showing less than one meter error they said that this is good and good this is good to go for a good flood flood forecasting model <clears throat> so then there was another issue now this flood model as you can see this urban flood model was done at two meter resolution which is a very fine resolution and when you run this kind of flood model for the entire city i'm not say, talking about the any locations about the entire city you're running at a very fine resolution it needs a lot of time for a single simulation it takes six hours or six, at least three to four hours of time even at high performance computing facility so the, the point was that by the time focus comes we do a lot of processing and then we you know of course everything is automated and then uh, you know we ran the flood model which is also automated then by the time the flood inundation maps will be ready by the time the flood will of course start so this was not a proper solution and this is one of the problem many real-time forecasting system uh, you know faces this is some this is a very specific problem so what we thought that let us create a flood data bank that means let us generate rainfall of different return periods different storm duration different past conditions different tide conditions and then generate we generate around 800 792 cases and for each of the cases we have generated the flood inundation maps so what is happening is that so we have a rich data bank where given different cases what are the flood inundation maps for the entire city which was being generated now what is happening so let's say at 3 p.m. You can see here at 3 p.m. the meteorological forecast is released. By 5 p.m. we have now the quantile uh, rainfall at different levels. We have the tide forecast, we have the upstream hydrologic forecast and the past condition. These are not time consuming. At 5 p.m. as soon as they are ready, we are checking at the data bank. We have already generated the data bank, the flood data bank from the different simulations. We are just first checking the data bank, find out the closest scenario and accordingly we are providing the flood inundation map for lead day one, lead day two, and lead day three. That means for day one, day two, and day three, what will be the flood inundation map? That is the first guess or the first release, which is which is being done in two to three hours time. So in two to three hours time, you know that what will happen tomorrow, day after tomorrow, and then the next day. So how it is being done? This is the forecasted rainfall, 80th, 80th percentile, 85th, 90th, 95th, 99th percentile. These are the forecasted tide. These are the past condition. And in the lookup table, we are checking for peak rainfall, total rainfall, highest tide, past, uh, past condition, etc. And then after checking all these four, we are finding the flood inundation level and then we are providing. Now, let's say it shows that flood is happening tomorrow and day after. So it shows that in the forecasted inundation, it shows that flood inundation is taking place for the higher quantile. So if it is showing, then we are trying the we are starting the real time simulation which will be which now this model is operational now in chennai ncc national center for coastal research earlier the name of the institute was icmap so in the at icmap or at ncc then the real time simulation started so we have designed everything everything is automated 
So as soon as it finds this, then the real time simulation starts and it provides every six hours with the six hour deterministic forecast, which I was mentioning earlier. It keeps, keeps on updating that what is the flood situation and how it is changing. But if there is no inundation, then we don't need to really perform any kind of real time simulation. We can save our computing time. So there is no real time simulation. So it gives the results like this. Let's say for 1st December 2015, for what is the for what is the flood inundation compute uh, for the 80th percentile, 85th, 90, 95th, and 99. You can see 95th and 99. You can see majority of the cities are inundated, and that's what actually happened. So it shows that there is a severe flood. Even for 80, 85, 90, also you can see many, many locations are actually flooded. So this is a case which shows that you know flood is actually happening. So this kind of forecast system is useful. And it is giving even at a world level, even at a building level. So we have generated a 3D visualization in such a way so that you can actually see what is happening even at a building level. Probably the accuracy may not be there at a very specific building level, but within one meter uh, accuracy is anywhere there. So it will, it, will, it will give the results like this. So this is the initial condition. That means 31st December, we are, uh, 31st October, we are uh, forecasting. This is for 1st November, 2nd November, and 3rd November. For 80th percentile, 85th percentile, there is no flood. But if you're going for 90th percentile, then you can see the flood. And if you click on the image, then you can give a, have a detailed information which is needed by the uh, municipal corporation. So this is the way we have designed. And this is now operational. And following the exactly the same algorithm, same methodology now for Mumbai also, Ministry of Arts Science has developed, which was the first time. And I'm really happy that you know this is being followed for other cities um, by the Ministry of Arts Sciences. Now the second one. So first one is urban flood forecast system. The second one is uh, over a large region, how to really consider it. So I'll quickly go through. So here, some of the interesting thing which you have considered. So this was actually published in Advanced in Water Resources. So what we try to understand here is something slightly different. So let's say if you're considering the conventional flood forecasting system, we have a weather model, we run a hydrologic model against the weather model. So it's actually adding one model to the tail of another and then visualization of the inundations. But what we have found is that there are a lot of limitations because of which these models are getting ready. People are getting a lot of papers, but finally it is not really helping the people because there is low heat rate, highest false alarm, and there are a lot of other issues. So one of the issues which I'd like to mention is that, let's say if you're considering a village and a city, in the city, the person who is, who is, li who is living at the 14th floor or 15th floor, he may not be affected much by the flood, but the person who is living in a mud house, he is very much affected by the flood. And so hence the, com hence the component that comes is vulnerability. Vulnerability is a very important factor. So when you start evacuation operation, the vulnerable regions you have to evacuate compared to the vulnerable regions. The third thing is that exposure, the low lying areas, which are more exposed to flood compared to the high elevation areas. So just the flood model may not be useful, but that what we need to consider is that we need to first consider weather forecast, but at the same time, from there we have to get the flood, but at the same time, we need to consider the vulnerability and exposure. So what we have considered here is that we have considered the weather model and observed data, and we have computed the conditional probability. Conditional probability means from the high cost, we are trying to find out what is the probability of extreme rainfall given this kind of forecast, which is there for tomorrow. So once we have the probability, of course, we did a copula-based approach to get the conditional probability. Then we are considering the socioeconomic condition and topographic condition to compute the vulnerability and land use land cover to get the exposure. And we have used the classical definition of risk, which tells that risk is a product of hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. And that provides a real-time flood risk. Let us look into this now. So this is the Kerala flood, which took place in 2017. And you can see that this is the um, and this is, these are the districts in Kerala and these are the weather forecast grids you can see here. And you can see that if you look into the forecast, you can very well see that the forecast shows that major rainfall over the oceanic region land than over the land regions. And what you can see here is that, sorry, this is the observed rainfall. So this was the observed rainfall. You can see over this region also there was a good rainfall. And these are the essentially the millions of now, if you look into the forecast, so this is the observed rainfall that took place over the Orissa. And these are the forecast. And if you look at the forecast, you can see that lead day 15, lead day 5, even lead day 2 also, you cannot see 
high high rainfall forecast over the Kerala region. You can see that you cannot see that very high rainfall forecast over the Kerala region. Even leap day two on 14th August, on 15th August, you can see that at least it starts providing the good forecast. So that shows that you are not getting a very good time for evacuation because just one day leap time you are getting uh, getting the forecast. Then only you are starting the evacuation. So that was one of the major issues. So what we have considered, we have we have proposed an algorithm where we have considered the joint probability so that hindcast is taking care of the error and uncertainty in the forecast. We are considering the elevated elevation data and demographic data to compute the vulnerability and land use land cover data to compute the exposure and then we have forecasted the risk. Now if you look into the risk, so we have considered very low, medium to high risk. So you can see first of that, first, first of all, I'd like to say is that many of the high risk regions actually was affected their flood loss the I mean, sorry the losses due to flood was very high so you can see the see the shaded part where the you can see these are the shaded part where you can see mostly this is red and orange and these are the regions where there was a lot of losses except this district you can see there is a green district which shows a very low kind of a um, risk but still it has it was affected badly and then when we looked into it we have found that this is because of the landslide and this model didn't consider the landslide so this model can be further improved considering the land you know landslide risk and if you merge them together then probably it will give the best so the thing is that just uh, you know, just hydrologic forecasting is not enough if you do not consider the socioeconomic conditions exposure and everything and that's the challenge and that we need to consider then the third question comes once we have the flood risk ready then how to start evacuating so one of the thing is that we have to evacuate in in, a, in such a way so that you know the high vulnerable regions and high flood affected regions are evacuated more compared to the lower one and the second problem which we faced is that you know that we know this year has been pandemic and last year we are we are suffering from pandemic and during the pandemic time you cannot really do the evacuation you cannot really ask all the people get evacuated and go into a shelter and from there there will be lord there will be a huge number of increase in the infections and that was a very real problem so then we started discussing with some of the data modeler who are working with covid and they 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 helped us with some model that takes care of the number of uh, modeling the number of infections using a complex network kind of system which is of course based on acirs kind of model and we developed a multi object so we have we have we have picked up one of the region which is the jagat singapore district in orissa we have the flood data and we have the village wise hazard values and uh, also we have the location of the shelters so what we considered we have considered an optimization framework where we are maximizing the uh, evacuation and the, and we are adding a weight in such a way so that the high vulnerable regions are getting high weight in terms of evacuation and also we are minimizing the number of infections so that the shelters from the shelters the infection number of infections should be minimum and we have we have considered all it was a highly complex nonlinear optimization model i'm not going into details but we have used the max min approach and we have performed it so objectives are for each of the shelter the infection should be minimized and the risk should be um, the, and the evacuation should be maximized for each of the district and when we solved it what we are finding is that so you can see that the uh, so you can you can see the differences so essentially you can see that number of infections can be reduced using this kind of model and at the same time what we could do is that we could actually increase the number of evacuations so we could improve the evacuation strategies we could improve the risk conditions and at the same time we could reduce the infections compared to the existing technique and existing strategies and we have actually communicated it to the Orissa government also uh, so that you know if, if it is some of the government officials and some of the district um, um, district head so that if needed they can actually use this kind of models and the last one which i'll be talking i hope i have around four or five minutes time so i'll quickly mention about this the fourth one which i have started mentioning that you know the farmers do not use the weather forecast so we wanted to understand how to make them how to convince them so that they can start using the weather forecast so what we did here is that we have considered again the concept of conditional distribution so what we did given a forecast we have generated a number of rainfall scenarios from the hindcast so based on the hindcast we are generating this so let's say tomorrow if it is the weather forecast we are generating given the forecast how may what are number of rainfall scenarios that are possible we have generated around thousand rainfall scenarios 
And at the same time, for most of the vineyards, they have a real-time soil moisture available, soil moisture sensors. If it is not available, then we are working in what way we are actually we can actually merge the existing soil moisture sensor data and the satellite data to come up with a very good soil moisture map. And then we ran an optimization model again. <clears throat> so where the decision variable is irrigation water application, then objective is to have to minimize the water use. Now the challenge was we need to model the farm scale crop uh, soil interactions. And the, for that we have used the farm scale hydrologic model, which is a very complex partial differential equation. We solved it. And our constraint was that the pro because we are not sure exactly what is happening for tomorrow. So we are, we are using a probabilistic constraint that the root zone soil moisture always less than the water stress threshold. That means below which, below this soil moisture value, the plant will go through water stress. So let's say we are saying that it should be greater than 0 0.95 or 0 0.9, which the farmers can consider. So let's say if it is higher the alpha value, higher this probability, that means better the solution. But at the same time, you have to use more water, obviously. So this one actually is accepted. It's, it's slightly older slide. So we have considered two regions. So we have developed this model with the farmers. So we discussed with the farmers. We tried to understand what farmers are doing. We have modified their algorithm. We have added the science component into the um, crop model. Then we have, uh, you know, we have, we have, we have, we have, we make them understand how the weather forecast work. And then when we started working them, so this is a bit complicated model. I'm not going into the details of the mathematics and the model. And then uh, we ran this model again. It was a complex optimization model. And what we are finding is that I'm just summarizing the results. These are for different reliability factors. And you can see that as you are increasing the decreasing the reliability factors, your savings in water use is um, increasing. But uh, under, I mean, but at the same time, we are not actually losing the yield. We are actually even with 0.5 also we are improving the yield, which is very important. And the farmers were actually very happy with this. The most important part here is that the farmers found that 10 to 30 percent water can be easily saved using this kind of approaches and they were kind of convinced yes the weather forecast is really useful earlier this advisory data they were not able to use but now they are convinced yes then they said that some tools are really needed to convert this kind of forecast for the societal application or for the stakeholders and that was we're very happy because this was a very good success story for, for us so as a summary as i was mentioning that we need to think out of the box for the climate solutions. The conventional solution may not always work. And uh, for that, we need to develop newer technologies. The newer technology should consider climate strongly. A climate input should strongly be there. And we need more entrepreneurs who are actually working on climate technology development, climate services. So these are actually very, very much needed in our country to cope up with the climate stresses. And the most important from the, on the government side also is that government industry collaboration should be improved and sharing data, sharing hindsight, that, that, that's the key. Just, just one ministry cannot solve the entire problem. They have to share the data with, with, with all the stakeholders. And so that the, together, the stakeholders and government organization, academic institutions, all of them can together co-develop that model. Co-development of model, co-development of strategies is the very important thing. And I hope in near future we'll be successful in doing so. Thank you very much for your patience. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you.